Zara Zoella Cunningham. Um, Dr. Cunningham received her medical degree at Edinburgh University Medical School in Scotland and her PhD at Warwick University Medical School in the UK. She is an attending physician in mitochondrial medicine at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Since 2011, Dr. Cunningham has received a UMDF small clinical trial grant and three UMDF Burroughs Welcome Travel Awards, which support biomedical scientists at the beginning of their career and areas of science that are poised for significant advancement but are currently undervalued and underfunded. Dr. Cunningham is active in other scientific and medical organizations as well, including the Society of Inborn Ear of Metabolism and the Pediatric Neurotransmitter Disease Foundation. Welcome to Dr. Zoros Zara Zoelli. Zoella Zolkipli Cunningham. I teach second grade and my phonics is crazy. <laughs> uh, second of all, I would like to introduce Jean Flickinger. Uh, Jean Flickinger is a board certified clinical specialist in pediatric physical therapy in the neuromuscular program at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where her expertise is in, is in childhood neuromuscular disease and infant development. She is also credentialed as a clinical instruction instructor by the American Physical Therapy Association. Please welcome Ms. Jean Flickinger. And I see a lot of faces from the Ask the Doc, and you should know their answer to all, a lot of the questions was, you need to move your muscles. <laughs> That's a good answer. Thank you, Barb. That was very nice. I didn't realize my name was such a tongue twister, right? But it is. <laughs> I, I do want to say this, though, um, because I've had several comments from people. So um, uh, Cunningham is my married name. So Kipley is not my middle name. It's actually hyphenated. So I had, a, I had problems because patients were trying to find me. And apparently, there's no Dr. Cunningham at CHOP. Uh, but there is a, Cunningham's quite a common name, I was surprised that was the case. Um, but now I've ensured it's hyphenated, so it's all Kipley Cunningham. Um, and I do also want to say that we're very lucky to have Jean. When we um, first brought her downstairs to so our mitochondrial clinic, Jean had spent uh, 23 years seeing children, um, babies with inherited neuromuscular disorders and um, older children. So. Um, when she came to our clinic, um, it was a big learning curve for her because um, now she's seeing a lot of adults. And uh, really the uh, experience she's accumulated in just two years, seeing 120 patient evaluations has been quite striking. So I think you'll find her talk really very helpful. So what I decided, or when I decided to submit this title to Kara, just as a proposal, um, this is not a typical um, title. It's not really, I have to say, even preparing the talk, I found it quite hard because it's not a lot of literature out there. But I do know over and over again when we have um, parent family um, discussions, this topic comes up a lot. And it's really quite um, um, hard for me to hear what the families are saying, um, which is primarily. Um, being seen by pulmonologists and being told there's nothing wrong with you, right, when you actually have the symptoms. So that's really why I propose this as a title. Um, so a lot of this today will be some slides, but probably a lot more discussion, and I, I'd love feedback from you. It's a very informal session, um, and same with Gene too. So we're going to be discussing the features of this medical term called exertional dyspnea, which essentially means exertion, so on exertion, so on activity. And dyspnea means being out of breath, okay? So basically being out of breath with a little bit of exertion. So we'll talk about the impact in testing and then Jean will speak. So just to mention if some of you were here yesterday, I can't highlight this enough, the clinical features of mitomyopathy. So I'm speaking now of mitochondrial myopathy, but really this 
symptom can happen in any type of mitochondrial disease. So mitochondrial myopathy is a subset of mitochondrial disorders, primarily where patients present with muscle-related problems. Muscle is the largest organ in your body. It really needs a lot of energy to be maintained for its contraction, um, and contraction is needed for any type of movement that you do. We know that the symptoms of primary mitochondrial disease are very, very, um, um, you know, 16 symptoms. I mean, of 16 symptoms is really what this graph shows. And I'm sure all of you would, would agree with that. So a mean of 16 symptoms, if you think about it, when you go to your doctor's office, right, you see the specialist for each single role there. Um, really, honestly, right? If you have a good internist or, or primary care doctor who's willing to sit and go through the 16 symptoms with you, then you're on to a winner, right? But most of us don't have that. Um, and this is really just, you know, I, I hope I show it just to be educational, to share with you that we understand that you have a lot of symptoms, but a lot of physicians don't. And it's really very, very burdensome disease. But in any case, the top um, five symptoms includes exercise intolerance, which is what we're going to be discussing today. So we published that, um, that bar graph, and I'm hoping that a lot more people see it to learn. But essentially, what is exercise intolerance? So how many of you have it? Right, so um, what would you describe, if I were to ask you what does, it, what does it mean having exercise intolerance, what would you say? Pain. Pain. Sure. running out of energy Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So those are very, very accurate. Um, very accurate. So that's what I hear a lot. So just, just to explain to you, what do you think the basis of exercise intolerance is? Um, and, and, you know, what I'm referring to here is probably very specific to mito, really, because you get exercise intolerance in somebody with cystic fibrosis or, you know, lung pathology or a heart, heart failure, right? But um, those are structural problems to those organs, whereby in mitochondrial disease we don't have structural problems to the organs, right? It's not something you can visualize on a scan. So what, what really is the problem? So we know that the mitochondrial function is to conduct this oxidative phosphorylation, which we'll call OXFOS, right? Because at the end of it, it spits out the ATP. And without that perfect performance of the OXFOS, you're not really going to get the same amount of ATP being produced in the mitochondria, right? So if you have mitochondrial electron transport chain deficiency or respiratory chain deficiency, they mean the same things, it results in exercise intolerance purely because you're not just producing as much bioenergy as the next person is. So if we think about it differently, if your mitochondria is functioning at 60% efficiency as the next person's, you still got 60% less ATP being produced, right? And some people might be 40% and some people might be 20%. So it turns out that the differences or the spectrum of your OXFOS deficiency is really what decides how exercise intolerant you are. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so I, I described it as basically what you said, inability to complete intended activity, tends to be restricted by tiredness, feeling winded, these are things I hear from patients all the time, muscle cramps as you mentioned. Feeling out of breath is something that people use too to describe exercise intolerance. And essentially the problem is it limits what you do, right? So as opposed to muscle weakness where you can't do something you want to do, exercise intolerance stops you from what you want to do, right? So both impact your quality of life, but one's more visually obvious when you're weak versus the other that's not visually obvious. Um, and, and that's hard. The, the exercise intolerance is hard. It's like walking to the train station, with people pushing behind you, uh, they can't see that you're different, um, and yet they're going to bump into you, right? So it, it, it's a problem. So, um, and, and I get it, and, and that's from hearing everybody um, tell us how the symptoms affect them. So, it is improved by rest. Sometimes I have some patients say it can, and then they have a second win, and then they can get up and do it again. Some can't, some try, and they can do a little bit more each time. Um, it definitely fluctuates, so some days are better than others, some months are better than others. Definitely worse when tired, right? What I mean by this is if you didn't have a good night's sleep, ugh, you know, just not great. If you didn't eat enough, if you had a few days of just not eating great, that, that's another um, scenario that I've seen it in. Uh, definitely when you're sick, definitely when you have some intercurrent illness, um, if you have a migraine going on, if you've got your constipation being particularly worse that week, it impacts your body skeletal muscle, right? So a lot of you are nodding and it, it's, um, clearly you're identifying with what I'm describing and what I'm describing to you is what I hear more from the patients. 
So, what the first thing I wanted to say to you is we, we understand. Um, and and I, I have to keep going back to um, the, um, the stark reminder that I have when I um, see patients and they tell me, you don't understand, it's so hard. If I had a walker or a cane, it would seem obvious to other people, but because I don't, it's, it's just socially um, disabling. So, I mentioned earlier the degree of exercise intolerance turns out is um, parallel to how severe your Oxford's uh, capacity is. And, you know, we've, we're able to measure this, you, you know that, right? So we can even take a muscle biopsy and measure your muscle mitochondrial function, but you know, that has its limitations. First, you have to have a biopsy, but second, if you think about it, you know, you have a biopsy once in your lifetime. And then we assign that understanding from that biopsy to your lifetime. Does that make any sense to you? No, it doesn't. Exactly. Because if you think about it, our metabolism changes over time, right? And one, maybe, you know, maybe you go for your biopsy and you had a bad week before that, and the electron transport chain is going to be pretty down. Maybe the next week is going to be a little bit up. We, we, we just don't know. So nowadays, in, in the current situation that we have with the diagnostic testing that we have is certainly inadequate. We realize that by far, which is why we have to seek other methods to measure your muscle mitochondrial function in as accurate a way as possible. So I'm a big fan of this picture here where we put you on either a treadmill or a bike. Some of you might have had it before because you had a cardiologist um, suggest doing a stress test. but. Uh, just so you understand, they're suggesting the stress test for a very different reason. They're looking for heart rhythm defects or uh, ischemic heart disease. But it turns out, even though you've had that for a different reason, there's a number assigned to the results, which is called the V, capital V, capital O, 2, max. So some of you are nodding if you've had it, and some of you haven't. The VO2 max is essentially your muscle mitochondrial function, is how well your mitochondria are respiring. So if you have a, an open muscle biopsy, we take your tissue, we isolate the mitochondria, and then that mitochondria is either put through um, a series of electron transport chain assay that measures your complex 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 activity. Uh, but if, you, um, if you're aware of a test called OXFOS, where we measure respiratory, so we're measuring how well your mitochondria respire. So that's performing a muscle biopsy. This is giving us the same thing in the VO2, but without taking a piece of tissue. The only caveat is you have to be able to do this test. So unfortunately, it's not going to be applied to all of you, sadly. Um, there actually is an arm cycle ergometry. I know that this is available. It just hasn't been validated well in our patient population yet. I submitted a grant for it and I didn't get it, unfortunately. But that was my intent to try and see if somebody is not able to perform the leg exercise but able to do the arm, whether we would get a good indicator or not. But right now, what we would say is, if able to, I, I, I'm a strong fan of having this done. It yet gives us another look at your muscle mitochondrial function, right, without, um, without having to be so invasive. So let me just share with you what you get out of this. So the very first paper to show this was by my friend here, Tanya Taibasalo, published in Brain in 2003. Um, it was a study uh, in 2003, you'll appreciate this was before um, access to genetic testing. So they, um, and this is a very important point, so they called what they had um, 40 patients with mitochondrial myopathy. And this was uh, patients who presented with a clinical presentation of myelomopathy, who then would have had a muscle biopsy, which confirmed mitochondrial dysfunction. So nowadays we know that some of those patients might not have primary myelomopathy disease, but in any case, um, this was a great paper. So what Tanya did was she basically put 40 patients onto that um, cycloergometer, which basically is that exercise bike. You have to follow a standard protocol where you start off slow and eventually it ramps you up and ramps you up and you end up at a very high level of exercise until you're absolutely exhausted. When you're fully, fully exhausted, we know that you're not using glycolysis anymore, but you're using your mitochondria to burn down fat. And then at that stage, all these indicators are reported. So what Tanya showed was, first of all, let me take you to this one. This is uh, watts per kilo, so that means work. So this is essentially your physical capacity, so how well you can exercise with weight. And basically, these are the controls, and so this is the myelomopathy group, right? So actually, small overlap, but really quite a striking difference in the mean values. This is the VO2. 
Again, similar pattern where it's really quite severely down around the 15 level compared to control individuals. So what does that tell us? It tells us that you, we do indeed have reduced maximal oxygen capacity in people with mitochondrial myopathy, which then means that you're not very efficient at extracting oxygen because oxygen is our substrate, right? Um, the reason you have blood going to your skeletal muscle is because it gives you oxygen to skeletal muscle. The oxygen is a substrate. It flows from the arteries into the tissues, into the cells, then into the mitochondria. Your mitochondria then suck it up, and that's how you then start off the oxfos process, right? And produces ATP. So this is why oxygen extraction from the arteries is really very important. And if you have an electron transport chain defect, you don't extract oxygen very efficiently. Is that clear? Does anybody not understand? Okay, good. The other impact of exercise, and I think some of you will identify with this, what happens when you're walking and you're tired and you've pushed yourself? What happens then to your heart rate? That's right. And, and you'll feel it, right? Your heart's pounding. Do you understand why that happens? Mm -hmm. This oxygen. It what? This oxygen pumped into the system. Yeah, that's right. So. Um, you know, to an extent, we would all do it. If, if I were to uh, be placed under a lot of um, exertional pressure, so needing to, I'm not suddenly running my iPhone tomorrow, um, I'm sure 10% of the way I would be <laughs> gasping for air and my heart would be pumping. So you're absolutely right. So your heart pumps because it's having to deliver oxygen to the rest of your body. So if it's not doing it very efficiently, the body compensates by pumping faster, right? So your heart ventricle is trying to pump out that oxygen via the blood, and in fact, if it's not doing it as well because it's pumping just 30%, it's gonna compensate by just doing 30%, but maybe six times more, right? So that is really why physiologically you get an increase in your heart rate. So it turns out that with mitomyopathy, not only do you get a decrease um, oxygen extraction efficiency. Also, when you exercise, your heart rate's way up and your breathing rate is way up, right? So these are all compensatory responses, but very important observations which help us in our um, monitoring and diagnostic purposes. So therefore, you know, we've explained exercise intolerance. I think then it's very easy to slip into now the topic of our conversation today, which is exertion of dyspnea. So how many of you experience exertion of dyspnea now? Okay. So how would you describe that feeling? Pumping and pumping, especially mm -hmm. on the stairs. That's right. Yeah, you know, like tightness in your chest. Yeah, that's right. Air yeah. hunger. Air hunger, somebody said? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So th these are all very um, common things that I hear too. So let, let's give a scenario. So. Um, Someone told me that um, they um, would have trouble going down the aisles at the supermarket. Um, and again, this is somebody who's ambulatory with no muscle weakness, um, but would be embarrassed because they couldn't get down that aisle to finish off their shopping. And would have to stop not even halfway and then stop and then be breathing heavily. Perhaps even look like they're having an asthma attack. Um, it, it got so... Um, socially difficult that this person didn't enjoy going to the supermarket anymore. Um, so that, that's really very impactful, right? So um, the feeling of gasping for air, not getting air in, feeling chest tightness, I think that's very typical. So I don't know how accurate this term is, to be honest with you. I think exertional just implies it's mitochondrial based because in general, you would get this symptom on some level of exertion, and that could be anything from getting up and taking a few steps to doing a half hour walk, right? It's very individual. But in general terms, if somebody just has dyspnea when they're sitting down, um, medically we attribute that to pulmonology or cardiology pathology, right? Because that's when you see it. But in a mitochondrial basis, generally you've got to stress the system first before the symptom arises, hence the word exertion of dyspnea. Does that make sense? But I don't think it's entirely accurate because I know that people do have dyspnea too just when they're sitting down. So um, 
it is a dominant feature of exercise intolerance, and I think basically that's what it is. I think I explained earlier, you're breathing fast, your heart rate's going up fast, and I think that's probably the basis of exertional dyspnea. I guess what I'm trying to say is exertional dyspnea is basically your exercise intolerance, right? It's just you expressing it slightly different. So we know that therefore exertional dyspnea is correlated to your respiratory chain function. And just swap something for you to understand, because I think this is helpful. Because sometimes when you do exercise tests, in some metabolic labs, they would actually draw your blood lactate. So I think it's helpful to know when your respiratory chain is not running as it should be, then what in fact happens is it reverts back to glycolysis, right? Because then it's just easier to burn sugar without having to use the mitochondria, because that step is outside the mitochondria. But, you know, that's time limited. It doesn't go on forever unless you're eating candy the whole time. So um, what then happens is you go into deficit and you develop your elevated blood lactate. Okay? So that's the basis of having blood draws with exercise tests. Some people do this. We had a clinical trial in Viada where that was the protocol, whereby somebody would have cyclorgometry and then at the baseline and then at the end, blood lactate would be drawn. And essentially what we find is a great gross elevation in blood lactate with exercise. So that's another marker too that, you know, um, your respiratory changes isn't functioning as well. So I can only share by stories of what people tell me, their journeys. Uh, and I've heard all kinds of journeys from speaking to families. And I think that the commonest thing that I've seen is that probably naturally, if somebody's out of breath, the primary care doctor would refer them to a pulmonologist. The pulmonologist would see you, and the pulmonologist is thinking lung pathology. So they listen to your chest, and then they don't hear wheeze. So then they think it's not asthma. They'll have you do a lung function test. And that's actually very dependent on how you are on the day. <laughs> so sometimes it'll be entirely normal, and then they'll say it's normal. Or it could show, and these are two terms I'd like you to be familiar with, obstructive lung disease, and that's reflective of something like asthma or chronic airways disease in smokers, or restrictive lung disease. And restrictive lung disease is the one I look out for. And not all pulmonologists understand the correlation between restrictive lung disease and neuromuscular disorders. So what, what am I talking about, this jargon? So basically, if you have muscle weakness, you have respiratory muscle weakness. And that respiratory muscle weakness basically means you're not ventilating as well as somebody else is, right? Your diaphragm's got to move up and down, your chest wall's got to move in and out. And if that's not working as well, your ventilation's not as well. And so when you're blowing into this, this tube here, um, essentially that's what a lung function looks like if some of you have had it, then it might just look like, um, so sorry, then it reflects restrictive lung disease. The next step I always find, because this is over and over again, we, I, I get a lot of referrals from pulmonologists, is they'll do a chest x-ray and maybe a CT chest. And if that's all normal, they'll tell you your, your lungs are fine. And then that's where this journey ends. Yet you still have these symptoms, right? So we're very fortunate at, um, at CHOP to be working with somebody next door who actually reached out to us first with one index patient and that developed a very nice uh, partnership and collaboration clinically and on a research basis whereby um, Dr. Fritz, uh, who's our pulmonologist at HUP, he's an adult pulmonologist, sends his patients, if he's done all the testing in a patient with dyspnea and doesn't find anything but suggests that there is something there based on the exercise test, he will send us patients. Conversely, we'll send him patients if we have uh, questions about where the origin of the dyspnea is coming from. And let me give you, uh, it's important to clarify this, if somebody's out of breath and has dyspnea, you know, a, a simple SAT sponaging, you know, you know, one of those probes being put on your finger, they tend to be normal. And I think that's one of the biggest telling signs, because if somebody's got lung disease, and if somebody's got severe heart disease, their oxygen levels can actually be low, whereas in mitochondrial patients, the, the oxygen level just on that simple measurement tends to be normal, okay? It's just going on the skin of your finger. No wonder it's normal, right? It's not measuring your muscle oxygen. So what we do then is, this is what we do. So this is a combination of um, two years of um, not having any data before and suddenly now having all this data. So 
Published literature tells us that the VO2 in mitochondrial disease is indeed low, but I think now in the era of genetic genomic testing, uh, I decided to relook at it again, but this time look at patients based on the certainty of mitochondrial disease. This is based on um, definite criteria, so either you have definite based on your genetic testing or probable if you look like it and you just don't have confirmation of genetics versus those that are unlikely to have it. So if you just look at um, this graph here in uh, box B, what I'm showing to you in black is patients who are apparently healthy controls and you'll see that their mean VO2 is about 40 uh, units. However, those with definite mito disease sits around 15 units. So it's about, you know, less than half of the normal population. It's no wonder, right? So if you think of this differently, if that doesn't make sense to you, if you think of it, your mitochondrial function just isn't as efficient as the controls, it's under half. So it's no wonder that we're expressing these symptoms. And this is why I find exercise testing helpful, because A, it's helpful for diagnostic reasons, to be able to categorize somebody to say, and, and by the way, it's not definite, but it's a very nice piece of the puzzle to be able to say to a patient, oh, you know, your VO2 sitting in the 30s, that's um, quite high and quite nice if you definitely have mito disease. Um, but if we're not sure, it seems that you're probably in the unlikely category. So that, that's how I use it. But also more importantly, I use it for following the patient over time because it's very nice to be able to know that your VO2 is going to be stable. If it dips a little bit, we try and think what we can do about it. Okay? Does all that make sense? So, so let's just go over that again because I think it's a lot of, lot of medicine. So in mitomyopathy, we have to think that um, the symptoms of breathlessness is linked to your exercise intolerance, right? And so therefore, I would like to think that um, people like my friend Jason Fritz, if um, a primary care doctor comes across somebody with unexplained breathlessness, they would think about my neuropathy. And generally, your lung function testing is normal, as is your saturations. Otherwise, we think about heart and lung problems. The exercise test is extremely helpful, I think. And then also the hyperdynamic responses, which are the increased heart rate and ventilation in response to exercise, are very telling signs. Are there any questions? Please. In someone who has the impaired respiratory muscle function, would the normal breathing physical therapy and normal, you know, the, sometimes they do it post op but if you qualify for that, would that help? Yeah, that's great. That's great. So Jean's going to be speaking about that too. I, I agree. You know, it's, I, I have a collection of patients who are adults who present with exertional dyspnea. I have to be honest, I don't know what their true etiology is yet, meaning their genetic etiology, but they're very disabled by their symptoms, ranging from inability to walk from the car park to the office to um, uh, be, being quite well on most days, but then once a month it's just horrendous. So the um, issue there is, despite not having a genetic diagnosis, doesn't matter. It's not like we just leave you aside. It's very, very important that we think about, or outside the box, and think about what we can do. So if we think about it and we're sure there's no heart pathology, then we're sure there's no lung pathology, then I absolutely do recommend exercise and working with a physical therapist. And remember, there's no goal. It's terrible when you think you have to reach a goal, because then you'll just fail and not want to do it. It's about maintaining your ability, because remember, exercise is a treatment, right? Yes. I have a, a, a question. When you were talking about the transport chain, um, you just where my defect is, uh, and I'm having a lot of trouble with blood sugar dropping. Mm -hmm. um, can that be related? Um, I work in the yard a lot, and even though I eat a breakfast of a high protein breakfast, it lasts me about an hour and a half, and then my blood sugar drops within the 50s range. Um, could that explain why that's happening? My doctor just tells me to eat every 90 minutes, but I'm concerned that there's something more going on. So, I mean, I agree it's not typical, but it can happen. We do see hypoglycemia and mito disease, but it would be important to exclude other things. Um, have you, do you have an endocrinologist? No, I have not. Well, I have not seen one in years. Okay, so that would be important, because first we need to confirm how low your blood sugars are, and then to have an endocrinologist complete an eval. 
very, very important because it might be something else where you're assuming is linked to myeloid disease, right? And I don't know that eating every 90 minutes is practical, yeah, right? Take another <laughs> that's right, that's right. But more importantly, what if you had a hypo event, I don't know, your sleep? So please see an endocrinologist. It's really important. <laughs> Oh. Like, and I have yeah. seen a pulmonologist and have had some of the, you know, the Including a sleep study? I did have a sleep okay. study as well. And it, like, he said the breathing test did show that I have some, um, some, some diaphragm, it could, like start weakening of my diaphragm. Um, but I just got like a, you know, Brio inhaler and yeah. but I haven't noticed any changes. Mm -hmm. And what about your heart? Um, I do see a cardiologist and I get a, a yearly echo like in terms of like looking at from my mito, but I, I don't, I haven't had anything extra looked at. Mm. Um, he so, just saw some changes in the diaphragm in terms of like weakness. I see. Um, I see. With, through the test that he, the you know, pulmonary functions test that he did. Um, I understand. I didn't know like mitochondrial wise if there's anything more that I should be looking at. So I, 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 I'm the opposite. I think we need to really be sure it's not your heart and your lungs first. As I mentioned earlier, exertional dyspnea is a bit of a misnomer because there are patients who get um, breathless while lying down. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that it would be essential though to be certain, and I have to say, and I don't want to say I'm recommending it because I'm not a pulmonologist, but Jason Fritz, who we work with, I've seen him in those scenarios where it's not certain if there is a cardiology or pulmonology component, they move on to something a little bit more invasive. Um, you know, it doesn't sound entirely pleasant, but I don't think it's a terrible thing either. Uh, basically, they do something like an angiogram, and they even get you to exercise during the angiogram. I, I don't know that this is available everywhere, um, but it is, um, I just think it's worth mentioning because maybe an echo and EKG would not be sufficient to detect something if there was something further in your heart function or lung. And I think it's really, really important never to close the window on other things, otherwise we miss out on the opportunity, right? Yeah. So I worry when, um, and as physicians we all do this, uh, we home in on the one thing where you, that's your comfort zone. Right. Um, but in fact, um, I would have thought, you know, you look, you, look, you look young to me, you're having dyspnea when you're lying down, I think it's super important to further your testing, particularly from the heart and lung aspect. Maybe just have a discussion with them and just say, more, more usually it's dyspnea, on exertion, maybe we just want to think about if there's any possibility of any vascular stuff. And you could ask about the. Um, I mean, I was amazed. They they put a they put a they put a line in your jugular vein, and then they, they do some angiogram, and then they make you exercise. <laughs> it's uh, it's I, I can't remember what it's called, but it's basically catheterized and exercise catheterized okay. test. Yeah, something well, like that. Absolutely. Again, I can't recommend it because I'm not a pulmonologist, right. but I I've seen this happen in adult patients, and sometimes it actually does really reassure me that there's nothing else going on in that angle for us to then say, hey, you, you got to exercise more. Because what if we exercise and you do have a heart problem, right, yeah. and we don't know about it? That wouldn't be very good. Right. Okay, one more question, then we'll pass on to Jean. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, Nipson, Baxton, and PV have all been abnormal in me. I think the Nipson and Baxton I think it reflects some muscle weakness, basically. That's what it reflects. And it's nice that you have a bone just who's doing that. And it's important to follow that over time. And it would be important for you to have a sleep study once a year to make sure there's not, nothing else. Okay? And then, uh, if possible, of course, it's nice to get an exercise test. But exercise test, remember, um, we want to make sure it's safe, right? You're, you're, you're really working yourself hard. You have to. Otherwise, we don't get such a reflective result. But we want to make sure it's safe. So anybody, anybody having an exercise test needs to have a heart exam by a cardiologist to say that it's okay to have this done. Okay? All right. All right. Hi. Welcome. Um, I wanted to just start. Let me get... Uh, get to the right place here. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to start with a review of the respiratory uh, muscles, the muscles used in uh, inspiration and expiration. Um, your primary inspiratory muscles, does anyone know what they, I'm going to quiz you on your anatomy here. <laughs> anyone know what 
big muscle is primarily responsible for taking a breath in. Diaphragm. 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 Good. Um, and also external intercostal muscles. There are these little muscles in between each rib. Um, and then for expiration, it's primarily a, a relaxation, recoiling effect um, at rest. But then when you're under a little more exertion, um, there's a lot of other muscles that come into play, um, including your abdominal muscles, um, your pectoralis minor here. Um, uh, and those are, sorry, those are expiration. Um, you also have accessory muscles when you're under stress for inspiration. And those are your scalenes up here, and a lot of your neck muscles. So when you're really working hard to breathe, sometimes you'll see those neck muscles really popping out, right? Um, this is a picture of the pectoralis minor. So when you are out of breath or when you see someone really struggling to catch their breath, what, what position do you usually see them get into? Hunched over. Hunched over and, and leaning on the leaning on your knees, right? Or, or leaning on something. You see, you'll often see people um, in oops, one of these positions here. Does that look familiar? Um, there's a, a reason for that. Um, and part of it's your, uh, it's, it's your body's response, a compensatory response to try and add, use those uh, accessory muscles better. So if you are, so for instance, this uh, muscle here, the pectoralis minor, when you're, um, its primary action is not to help with breathing. Its primary action is to actually, it's attached on the scapula here, and it uh, depresses your scapula um, and downwardly rotates the scapula. But when your arms are fixed, um, it can re work in reverse action. So um, if your arms are fixed, your, um, it's going to help pull and open your, elevate your rib cage to take a, a to help take a deeper breath in. And there's other muscles um, in the trunk that help and act the same way as well. Um, your neck muscles, same thing. Um, their primary action is to flex your neck and tilt your neck. But if your head is still, they're going to help elevate that, elevate your ribs um, and clavicle. To help take a deeper breath in. Um, I wanted to show you, so this website here, abandayoga.com, um, I wanted to show you a nice, their website has a really nice video of, you can actually see the muscles in action. Unfortunately, I was not able to bring that up here on this computer, uh, but jot that down if you can because it's, they actually give really nice instructions on some nice breathing exercises to help improve your accessory uh, muscle strength. Um, and you can see in this picture here, it's a yoga position. Um, you're fixing your arms on your knees and that's gonna help those accessory muscles work in that reverse action. And there's also these back, back muscles here can also help. Um, so there's a lot of nice um, postural exercises that can help these muscles. Oops, go back. Um, okay. Oh, I just wanted to point out one more thing. Because I think the diaphragm is a really hard muscle to visualize. Uh, and that's this muscle right up here. It's dome shaped. So your diaphragm, when it contracts, actually uh, pulls down. So it allows the lungs to fill. Um, and again, that's why you're. Um, your core muscle strength is really important as well because um, your abdominal muscles will help with the expiration phase. So um, if your abdominal muscles contract, they'll help push uh, the inner organs up and help with that breathing out phase. So there's a, a lot more muscles involved in, in breathing, especially under stress, than you would think. Um, so some core muscle strengthening is really a nice way also to help with that. Um, I came upon this uh, article, um, something I hadn't thought of before. 
Uh, it's popular. It's called Nordic pole walking. Has anyone ever seen this? <laughs> you have. Okay, we got one. Very popular. Um, a lot. It started in Scandinavian countries. They used it to train um, for cross country skiing on the in the warmer months. Um, but they found some nice things. Um, it's a nice low impact exercise. Um, they found some nice benefits over regular walking. Um, since you're moving both arms and legs, um, you're using more, uh, more than 90% of your muscles, where if you're just walking regularly, you're only using about 50%, because you're just moving your legs mostly. Um, and they found that um, you can also walk faster than typical if, you, if you're trained in how to use these. There's a little bit of a technique to it. Um, you don't put them out front like you see a lot of <laughs> people uh, try that at first. You're actually leaving the pole behind you. Um, it's getting uh, popular in the trail running community. You'll see some runners on trails will actually take their poles and, and use the poles on the elevations um, part. But um, basically, um, you can walk faster, you're using more muscles, so you're actually burning more calories um, and you're um, expending more energy. Uh, most of the studies are about 20 to 25 percent more energy walking this way than typical walking. Um, but despite this, it's, it's more tolerated, so people don't feel like they're walking, they're working harder. Um, so it might be a nice, I don't know, it might, might be something to think about. The other piece I like about it is if you have imbalance issues, you have the poles, so it's a little bit safer. You might be able to push yourself a little bit more. Um, so it's definitely something I may start recommending, or at least to try, if it's appropriate. Um, and again, uh, if you're at the talk yesterday, we touched on this. Um, I really think this endurance exercise is key um, to really improving that VO2 max that Dr. Zakipli Cunningham was uh, talking about. Um, it seems to really, uh, and there's uh, lots of different ways to do endurance training, um, but uh, studies have shown in small numbers now um, that you can improve your capacity to work, um, your, you can improve that your skeletal muscles ability to utilize that oxygen. Um, it's well tolerated um, and uh, it's been shown in this one study uh, by Tabasalo um, that uh, you can also, patients feel better after they do it and they are, their rate of perceived exertion they, gets better the more they train. Um, and another important thing they pointed out was that if the exercise did stop, um, you would lose all those training benefits, so you really have to continue the training um, to receive those benefits. Some other endurance-based exercises, uh, bike riding is a nice one, um, swimming, horseback riding, um, a lot of our kids really enjoy that. And you get the dual benefit of strengthening your core muscles. Um, any adults do therapeutic riding? I'm just curious. You have in the past. You have in the past. And it, it, it actually really, it does really work your core. It works your core, right? Like, times Yeah, yeah, it's, it's harder work than you would think. Yeah, I had to cut back on the amount of time I did it. Um, gotcha. The first couple of times, but then but I was able to work it back up. Great, great. Yeah, yes? My son did wheelchair sports, football, and basketball for years, and that was very cool. Oh, yes, that's great. Absolutely. Uh, that's another great, great option. And anytime you can make your exercise more fun. <laughs> you're more likely to stick with it. Um, aquatic therapy is a really nice environment to work. Um, there's a lot of properties of the water, um, such as buoyancy, you know, you're, it's less stress on your joints. Um, the hydrostatic pressure of the water actually will provide resistance to your rib cage expanding as you take a deep breath in. Um, so it can really actually challenge your breathing a little more when your body is submerged under the water. Um, 
It can also help with swelling. If anyone has any issues with swelling, that, that hydrostatic pressure can help with that venous blood flow return to the heart. Um, and then just moving in the water and the turbulence and the fluid, the resistance of the water can help strengthen. And again, your full body workout, so you're hitting a lot of muscles at once. So again, you're getting more bang for your buck. Uh, I, like, I like to really find those types of exercises um, since you're limited in how much you can do. So if you can get a lot of things done at the same time, that's always good. Um, there's a nice study now, I, I didn't find any studies in this mitochondrial population, but uh, there's a lot of studies comparing working in the water versus on land, uh, doing some breathing exercises, um, and they found that there's definite benefits to working in the water over uh, land therapy. Um, respiratory muscles improved in the water compared to um, the land. And these were uh, breathing exercises. Um, I think that study was done here with Jones group um, in patients with spinal cord injury. But again, it was just comparing in the water versus out. Um, and then another study in healthy older adults, uh, they showed that the inspiratory uh, strength improved. Um, they didn't find as much of a difference with, thank you. <laughs> I'm getting a five minute warning from the back. <laughs> I think we went way too far over yesterday. Um, so inspiratory strength improved, probably because of that water resistance, that kind of makes more sense. Your hydrostatic pressure is providing that resistance to taking a breath in. Uh, it probably actually helps assist the expiration part, so that, that made sense to me. Maybe, G, can you just mention how, how, yeah. would get, how would they get access to aquatic therapy? Access to aquatic therapy? Um, that varies where you are. Um, if, if you want to work with a therapist in the water, um, you would need a prescription uh, for aquatic therapy. Um, it's often covered. I don't hear that much that it's not covered by insurance. Um, I hear more that it's hard to find the right place, especially if you need a uh, way of uh, help to get in the water, if they don't have the right lift to get you in, if you need that. Um, and uh, water temperature sometimes is an issue, or the water's too hot or too cold, and that's, that, that plays a role too. So, um, yes, in the back. Right, that's a good point too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, other things that can impact your breathing is things like scoliosis. Um, you can see here um, the side that you're bent over towards is going to impact how much that lung on that right side is going to be able to expand. Um, and sometimes I'm just simple posture. Um, a lot of us tend to slump, we round our shoulders, so we all do it when we're relaxed. Um, but really training to get in a better posture can really help um, keep those muscles at an optimal length um, to allow better um, breathing. Um, if scoliosis is severe, uh, the use of uh, a TLSO brace um, might be recommended by your orthopedic doctor. Um, there are some less um, rigid braces out there. This is a short step brace. It's made of a lot thinner plastic that's a little more flexible. Um, but again, if you're having difficulty breathing, you want to make sure that there's an abdominal cutout to allow your abdominal muscles to, um, to expand a little bit on uh, inspiration. Because uh, it can be very, feel very restrictive um, almost restrict your breathing if you don't have that. We're almost there, folks. <laughs> um, 
This is another, again, Speedo vest, kind of like, almost acts like a girdle. It's a compression <laughs> suit um, that can help kind of cue your postural muscles, so it can be effective. Um, I've had a couple families tell me uh, when their child is in something like this, their balance has improved as well, because it gives your body a little more feedback as to where it is in space. Um, and then there's other components you can slide in if you need a little bit more written support. Um, energy conservation, maybe you <laughs> is key. You know, you want to avoid overdoing it um, so that you have time and energy for the things you want to do. Um, taking rests when you need it. Um, I just want to show you this is uh, my last last video. Um, it's kind of a nice and I did ask him if I could use this video. <laughs> he was very excited about this new uh, wheelchair. So this is a manual wheelchair, but it has a power component, and it's a smart drive. He's showing you the, the feature there. <laughs> um, he has a watch, and it's connected to the watch. So he just has to clap his hands twice to get the uh, power to, to go. I really like this, that he can you know, still be able to push it himself when he needs to and when he has the energy to. But then if he gets fatigued, he can use the power power component. And I am getting this. There it goes. <laughs> but I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Oops, there he is. <laughs> and I don't know, do, can we do a few questions? I'm getting the times, times up button in the back. Yes? Are there bicycles for adults? Bicycles for adults? I mean, yeah, I mean, that can also be assistive like that. Yes, that's a great, yeah, I should have had a bike picture up there. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, there's um, Amtrak is a, a brand that makes um, adaptive bikes. There's a couple other brands out there. They're usually three-wheeled, so they're very stable, so you don't have to worry about the balance piece. Um, there's a lot of organizations out there. Ambox. Dot org is um, an organization that can help fund the bikes because they're usually not covered by insurance. Um, and there's a lot of the volunteer, local volunteer organizations that help fundraise to pay, help pay for the bikes because they're pretty expensive. And there's a lot of different features that can help you feel more stable and safe on the bike. Um, but thank you, that's a great, great idea. So, so okay. it looks like we're running out of time. Oh, what's that? The resources one more time. Yes, um, Amtrak is the, the name of the bike, but the volunteer is A M T R Y K E. And the website is Ambux, A M B U C S dot org. I have one comment just really quickly. I'm, I'm quite sensitive to the fact that we have been speaking about exercise in ambulatory patients and um, probably should have had one slide perhaps on um, what can be done if you're non-ambulatory. I think since we're running out of time, maybe we can have a discussion after the session if you're interested. Okay. Outside, I'm being told. Outside. <laughs>